Trapped, yes. Have you got enough room? Yeah, I'll do without this actually because I can't see the screen. Do you want to... Shall we lift that off? Okay. There you go. Anyway, welcome, welcome. Hello, everybody. Good morning. So I'm going to start talking about fibres. Boring. In particular, man-made cellulosic fibres. So even more boring. So maybe I can persuade you otherwise, because I think in, in uh, your careers are going to be different to people of my generation. Because when I was growing up many years ago, because I think at my age, I've, the average age is bumped up to over 40, just taking my age into account in this room. Um, you'd look for the job in the back of Draper's record. And uh, does Draper's record exist still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you would see adverts for uh, fabric tech, or garment tech, or color development, or designer, or... And today, you probably just see adverts for this superhuman textile person who has to do all those things. And on top of that now, you may be expected to know things about the environment and sustainability. Um, because for sure in the future, as Miguel alluded to, um, you, if you are from a design background, you're absolutely going to have to take account of environmental issues. And um, although fibres are way away down the supply chain from what you might do, they, along with dyeing and finishing, they probably have the biggest environmental impact by far. Um, and today in denim, well, before in denim, it would just be cotton. You'd only have to learn about cotton. But today uh, in denim, it could be cotton, it could be tencel, as I will talk about, polyester, elastanes, linens. Um, a fabric might not even contain any cotton at all. It might not even be a woven fabric. So the whole landscape has actually changed. Um, so things that you may think, you know, boring or irrelevant, actually they probably won't be in your lifetime. Sorry, I'm in the way of the things. So that's the fibres landscape, actually. Um, so you have uh, natural fibres or you have man-made fibres. And within man-made fibres, um, you have things that come from natural polymers and you think that come from protein based and then you have synthetics like polyester, polyamide that are derived from oil. So what I'm going to talk to you today about are down here, viscose, modal, lyocell. So, many, not many years ago, a few years ago, I received a phone call from somebody who worked for uh, a jeans brand whose name I won't mention, a small brand but based in the West Wales and they're quite famous. And the guy introduced himself as the technical director, very important, the director of technology. So he said, um, he said can, can I ask you what lensing do? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah basically we we produce fibres from trees. And I said, so just like cotton, we're just making cellulosic fibres. And he said to me, can I stop you there? And I said, what? He said, what's cellulose? Which was a surprise to me from a, coming from a person who describes them as a technical director. But so cellulose is something that you see all around you in nature, trees, bushes, grass, seaweed, is cellulose. And um, basically it is made up of carbohydrates. So um, sugar, so if you take a glucose molecule and you line them up together, that's what is cellulose. 
So it's basically sugars like glucose. So out of all the fibers there, out all the fibers on that chart, they're the ones that the that lensing who I work for make. Viscose, modal, and lyocell. And lyocell we brand as Tencel. So Tencel is a brand name, lyocell is the generic. And cellulose is all around us. So we, there's, there's a huge amount of cellulose on Earth. Um, and probably about 1% that exists in the world goes into the pulping industry. And out of that 2% of that 1% goes as pulp for the textile fiber industry. And 15% of that 2% of that 1% is used by lensing. So we're, we're, we're using a very small amount of the available cellulose on Earth. And if you look at where cellulose might come from, a co cotton is almost 100% cellulose, whereas a tree is probably just under about 50%. We take trees for our fibres. So if you look at man-made cellulosics, there are different processes. The one that's been around the longest is the viscose process, as that's been around for over 100 years. Um, out of the viscose process, you had a refinement of the process about 40 years ago, and that produced something called modal. Modal is a type of viscose. It's just a better performing viscose, higher strength, higher wet strength. The lyocell process, um, was commercialized in the early 90s, and this was a real revolution in the industry. And it was really designed to replace viscose. So, um, but when, when it came into the market, the fibers had so many different properties that actually it became a new generic. So not here by design, really. Um, cupramonium um, was uh, a process that was quite dominant through the 60s but because of environmental reasons, it almost died out. There's only one supplier left in the world, Asai Corporation in Japan. Um, and acetate process, is, is, uh, that's a specialist process that's done by a few companies, but not, it's not something you'll see in denim. So I don't expect you to understand this uh, slide, but you can see the viscose process is on the left, and the lysol process is on the right. So the viscose process is highly complicated. And that whole process probably takes about 24 hours. Um, and one of, the issues, one of the issues with cellulose is that it's a very difficult thing to dissolve. Um, I mean, humans can't consume it and break it down. So the viscose process um, is a process where you have to change the cellulose into something else before you can actually dissolve it. And why do you want to dissolve it? Well, if you're going to form, if you're going to form filaments, or filaments then you chop into fibers, you need to have it in liquid form to force it through spinnerets, like a shower head. So you have to change a solid wood into a liquid. So you have to solubilize it. And for more than 100 years, there wasn't really a way to do that. So you had this very complicated process called the viscose process. Whereas the lyocell process here is very simple because um, a solvent was found that could directly dissolve cellulose. Uh, and it, in fact, it was technology that hung around for 60 odd years. So um, a company called Eastman Kodak, um, you're all too young to probably know who Kodak was, actually was. Kodak used to make films for cameras. Your mum and dad will explain what that means. So they, need, they needed celluloid, celluloid film, and they had a patent in 1939 that took a certain 
certain chemical and it was able to dissolve um, cellulose. And that patent was taken to, to use in here. So you have a different, a completely simple process. So you have the wood pulp, you add water and solvent, and you make your fiber, and the solvent is just stays within the process. It's called a closed loop system. So you'll, in your lifetime, you'll, you'll hear about closed loop systems. So a very simple process, very neat. And I, I started working for the invention of this, uh, in this product in 1995. And I used to start talking about its environmental properties and how good it was. Uh, and in 1995, nobody gave a stuff about sustainability. So it used to be one apologetic slide at the end of pre presentation, and all the designers are packing away and saying, yeah, yeah, nobody will pay for it. Uh, and now it's probably the first 10 slides of any presentation about the environmental characteristics of Tencel. So how times have changed. So if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, uh, the amount of fiber in the world that's made, we're, we're just over 100 million tons. And a lot of that is dominated by synthetic fibers. So you have cotton here at the bottom that really hasn't increased in, in the last 30 years. Here are all the synthetic fibers, mainly polyester, and little old man-made cellulose is here. But with the with the rise, well, uh, with um, with the improvement in uh, sustainability, uh, uh, excuse me, with the interest in sustainability, suddenly wood-based fibers, man-made cellulose fibers, are growing the fastest per annum. Now, finally. So there you have it there. So Visco is 80 years old, Mordal 60 years old, Lysel 25 years old. And at 25 years old, that, that's, that's very young for a fiber. I think it probably took 15 to 20 years before they worked out how, how even to dye polyester. So there's a long way to go with the understanding of, of lensing Lysel and Tencel in this world. So that's, that's the value chain of what the company I work for. So we go from forestry to wood, wood to pulp to fiber. Um, and then from there, many textile applications or you go into technical applications like non-wovens for wipes. So on the textile side, it goes into many areas, not just denim, so intimate and active and, and home. On non-wovens, it goes into many different things for wipes. Um, and on, on what we call industrials, it goes into filtration, it goes into footwear. Um, a lot of the byproducts of our processing are used, for instance, like here. Uh, we recover acetic acid from our process and it goes into foodstuffs. So we have a, we have a lot of things that, that are used or reused or refined. And when you look at um, how things are assessed in terms of environmental assessments, um, they call them tiers. So fibers are tier four. Um, yarns are tier three, fabrics are tier two. Finished products, garments are here. Um, and what tends to happen today is that brands and retailers only really bother themselves with here. One and two. So if you see here, this is percentage of US companies about their supply chain mapping. And very few of them actually look back at the impact of fibers in their supply chain. But ironically, this is where a lot of the impacts are coming. 
So this is a change that's required in our industry, and this is probably an industry that you'll go into and where fibres will become more and more important. Um, and companies like ours, instead of us taking wood, making pulp, making fibres, thank you very much, now we are looking at every part of our business to see what we can make of it. So companies not like ours now are looking into something called biorefinery. So you're looking at all the things that you could do with a tree or you can do with the processes you're, do, you're using on the tree. And the, so things like here, uh, these are all products that we now make. So for instance, xylose, is a natural sugar that, uh, that um, comes from beech wood. So we use beech wood for making modal. Uh, we extract and we, we take and we make something out of xylose, which is a natural sugar. So if you've in, t in mints and in toothpaste, that's the sugars they use. So this is a whole new, new area of industry for companies like ours in relation to having a more responsible and sustainable business. So, in, I think 2010, I was at a conference in New York run by an organization called the Textile Exchange. And um, they were an organization that were, came out of an, um, an organization called the Organic Exchange, who used to promote organic cotton. And then they started looking at more aspects of the industry. And at the, end, the, at the end of the day, they had um, one of their main speakers get up on stage, uh, Yvonne Schoenard, I think his surname is. He's the guy who started Patagonia. Um, and they're kind of one of the leading environmentally responsible brands in the world. And um, he's a bit of a maverick. I mean, he's in his mid-70s. And he started talking. He outed... Um, an, a secret organization. So a whole load of brands have been meeting in secret in the US to talk about coming up with a new environmental standard because they were, um, they were fed up of the fact that there were over 50 certificates and standards that they had to comply with. And it was a nightmare for them and it was expensive and they wanted to come up with one overall umbrella standard which, and that organization today has morphed into something called the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. I don't know if you've heard them, SAC. And they've come up with this overall index called the HIG Index. Um, but unfortunately for the guys in the supply chain, that burden has now come down to companies like ours. So that just gives you a snapshot of the things that we are trying to, organizations that we are trying to work with or certificates that we are trying to uh, attain. Um, and we used to have, um, our sustainability team used to be one person, now it's about 10 people, and they're still just as busy. If we had 100 people, we'd probably still be very busy. So that's the landscape today. Um, I think we're going through this process where we've expanded to this whole thing and now I think there's the chance to actually focus down. So with the sustainable de development goals uh, and on back of that something called uh, science-based targets here. Suddenly, you, if, you, if you're signing up to these things, everything is it's transparent, everything is online, they can see what you are promising to do and you're going to be held accountable. Science-based targets are going to be a game changer because everybody's been making claims uh, about anything, a lot of greenwash. Well, who says this product is responsible? Well, Michael Kinman says it is. Michael Kinman's certification says it. So I, I think now we're going to get a whole narrowing down, hopefully. But that's the landscape today. And that's the landscape that you are probably going to meet in your lifetime, in your career. Um, 
and from day to day, this is, this is what we face. We, we have customer expectations. So we have um, if, water issues. We've got Adidas, Puma, Johnson Johnson asking us for things. Energy C CO2 emissions. These are just things recently that they're, you know, CNA, GAP. So every, every brand has their own targets and every brand are expecting you to comply with their targets. So it's a, it's a mammoth job for any company today. Some of, the, some of the main companies today and some of the organizations you might meet in your time, Sustainable Apparel Co Coalition, I talked about Canopy, are particularly interested in forestry, Circular Fibers Initiative, which is an initiative out of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, ZDHC, it deals with chemicals, textile exchange, I talked about science-based targets, World Economic Forum, and it can go on and on and on. And companies like ours, here's our latest three developments, two of them here, Ecovero and Refibra, are, 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 are based solely in, on environmental improvements. So companies are basing a lot of their developments on uh, improving their, their sustainability. But even if you are not interested in, during your career, from a private point of view, I think you know, the environment is going to become more uh, important to you. And um, things that, that one, one thing in sustainability that nobody takes account of is, is the time element. So what was sustainable five years ago pr maybe isn't today because things have changed. Even problems that weren't around five years ago suddenly they're here and you're having to deal with them. So this is one of them and hopefully this video will play. You think this is? So the answer could be clothes under my daughter's bed, but that's not the answer. So that was the stomach contents of a dead camel in the Arabian desert. And that was an installation by uh, a photographer, I don't, he's, I th he may be Canadian or American, he's called Chris Jordan, and he previously done work uh, in back in the 2010. Um, so here you have the most remote, remote landfall on Earth, the Midway Atoll, because it's midway between Mexico and Southeast Asia. And he went there and he took a series of photographs, and here are photographs of dead albatross chicks, because their parents feed them with all this stuff here thinking it's food, and of course it has no value as food, and they starve to death. So this is the most remote island on Earth where these seagulls and these birds are, and they're, they're dying a horrible death. And this was back in 2010. Um, and I know people's consciousness about this thing only really came about with David Attenborough, the, the Blue Planet. Why is this relevant to textiles? Well, this pollution you can see. Everybody can see it. But the pollution from microfibers, nobody sees. So microfibers are textile fibers. And today, um, they are invading our space. It's probably, we've all probably got fibers in our guts fibers in bottled water that you buy everywhere. So this is a challenge that wasn't here a few years ago. 
and companies like ours have to react to it. So here you can see that we have certifications for our fibers um, in terms of biodegradability. So we have certifications to say that our fibers, either in soil or in marine or in water, are guaranteed to break down over a certain time. So who knows what's coming your way in your lifetime? Um, this whole thing about sustainability for me is really invigorating our, our industry. It's an exciting time and you have to embrace this. Uh, and you have, to, you have to challenge every claim that you see about product. I've just come back from the Textile Exchange Conference in Vancouver this week. Um, and I would say 50% of what I saw or heard was BS, actually. Um, so um, you need to get educated as best you can in this way. And like somebody said before, all these responsible companies who are speaking today can do that for you. So just ask them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I just want to say um, thank you to Mike. My Mike, Mike, obviously he's obviously the, the father of like Tencel, like sort of, sort of like, uh, 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 Lysel, which is you know it's super duper important. And you know, some of the most like sustainable denim that's made right now is using that so actual actual like fiber. fiber. Um, are there any questions now? This is super important. Are there any 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 questions at all for Michael that any anyone has? Okay, I've got the mic, so I'm going to run to to you, and then let's do it. Let's go. Go for, go for it. Hello, hi. Um, I had a question about, oh, this is really loud. Um, with Lyocell, um, I was wondering what kind of wood it uses, and then once the growing demand of this fiber is around, um, how will that affect the biodiversity? So, um, today it's mainly um, eucalyptus. Um, all, all, we do not take wood unknowingly from anything that's not certified. So I think the most famous uh, forestry certification you'll find is FSC. You see it on wood products, on, on paper products. Um, and that's always been our policy, but we're really being held to account by, by an organization called Canopy. If you go online and look for Canopy, they are holding to task, to account, our industry. And they are creating uh, a pathway where people can improve and they, 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 will, they will measure you on that. And so we are, uh, we are at the top of that uh, analysis. They, they have a, like a traffic light system, green, amber, red. So there's plenty of our industry in the red area. Um, in, in terms of diversity, so where we take our uh, eucalyptus from is in South, South Africa. Um, and the areas that they plant up there are, are mixed. Um, but at least I'd say 25% of that forestry is, is, uh, is never cut down. And um, they have uh, a whole policy um, of um, making sure that um, they support local economy and biodiversity. Um, and that probably goes for most responsible forests around the world. And actually, I know people get emotional about chopping trees down, but um, these, these forests would not exist without industry. Um, and um, I saw a program many years ago on um, um, building, uh, building houses in the UK, and they were building this big house from oak, and it took 300 trees. And these trees were over 300 years old. But even so, they were grown purposely for this purpose and wouldn't have been grown in the first place. But the, so there is a lot of responsible forestry that goes on around the world, but still there's a lot of stuff that's, you know, that's naughty. 
So there are different uh, certifications bodies like FSC, there's PEFC, there's SFI, uh, all, all looking to certify, and there's you know, organizations like Greenpeace and Canopy who were actually policing it. So I think actually um, a, lot of, a lot of the trees that we take are from temperate areas. They're not, they're not from places like the Amazon. But I'll, gi I'll give you, for instance, we have a competitor until now who has never actually come and marketed themselves at shows. Uh, they're based out of Indonesia, and they were at this show in, um, uh, this week in, in Canada uh, talking about their environmental footprint. But they're not talking about the fact that their parent company has been responsible for bulldozing f forests in Indonesia for the last 30 years to grow palm oil. So there's still a lot of that no uh, nonsense going on. But if you didn't know that backstory, they're there at this conference this week saying, look how good we are. Uh, and young people are there in the audience writing it all down. I'm writing it all down. Well, this looks really, yeah, this looks really good. So actually, you have to be, you know, you have to question, every, like I said before, you personally have to question all these things. What's behind it? What's the real story? Okay. Um, one more question. Anyone wants to say? Okay, straight there. I'm gonna run over to you. Say, so, uh, hi. Uh, I was just wondering, are you interested in hemp? Do you see, like, with the past, <laughs> well, not so much recreationally, but um, as a business, like, with the passing of the farm bill, is it going to make a difference if 60% of cellulose of hemp is 60% of hemp is cellulose? Going forward, I mean, the, these are good stories, but um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a parallel story. We were asked to look at nettles. Uh, in, in actually, giant Himalayan nettles for, for cellulose. I said, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, send us a bag. And it arrives, and we looked at it. And it wasn't perfect, because you have a lot of stuff in there that's very difficult to get out. And a lot of the plants suck up uh, sand silica, which is not good for our process. But we looked at it and said, oh, well, this looks okay. But when I went back to ask about this, I said, well, how do you farm these things? Uh, and they said, oh, well, it's, it's, it's people, local people do this. They go into the forest and they cut it down. And I said, well, how do they prepare it? Because the outside of the nettle, a bit like hemp, is no good for anything. You have to get rid of the outside. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, they, they get rid of the outside because they use their teeth to, to remove it. So can you imagine? Yeah, we'll, we'll put an order in for 10,000 tonnes of that. Yeah, I think the local dentists are going to be really busy, you know. So, so it's a non-starter, if you know what I mean. And hemp could be a possibility, but it's difficult. And you're in an industry now where you've got this huge price point culture, which, is squeezing, which has squeezed the life out of the supply chain for the last 30 years. And the supply chain probably could do it, but there's no incentive to do it because it's very difficult to pay back. So there isn't an industry set up to deal with the issues of it. it. There could be. But the other thing with hemp is you've got very irregular fibres, very long, fat, thin, and it, it'll always look uneven. So it's never going to look like cotton or whatever. So it always looks rustic and everything else. So it, it has a place, but in the end, you know, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it's a duck, and it's not cotton or something else, you know? One more question from the crowd. Um, you talked about um, it taking many years to figure out how to dye polyester. Yeah. Um, how do you dye a lyocell fibre? Well, lyocell is cellulose. So all the dyes that were developed for cotton will, will die on, on lyocell, viscose, yes. So in that way, it's very compatible for denim. You take the fibre and you spin it in the same way as cotton, or you spin it with cotton. And you, you process it on the same machines, and you dye it with the same things. Compatibility is important. As soon as you have a fabric where you have other fibres in there that won't dye with cellulose fibres, it's just an extra process, and, and, and. 
So that brings you back to circularity. You know, should the industry be, de be designing products as much as they can that are based out of one fiber or one fiber, you know, cellulose? It's probably yes, because recyclability, I haven't even touched on it. But that's another thing to think about. All right. Well, thank you so, so much, Mike, Mike Michael. Okay. And, um, thank you. Thank, thank you so much for your time. And now, thank you again. Yeah. Okay. Definitely.